Welcome to Smith Weekly Discussions, an occasional program for our readers and listeners of Smith Weekly Research. Please note this program is a private discussion and everything contained herein is for entertainment and educational purposes only. With that, we hope you're in a comfortable position, along with your favorite beverage, to enjoy the discussion. We remind our audience to examine the show notes attached to each of our shows to better understand how our program functions. Before we get into our discussion, we want to say thanks for questions coming from our audience at Smith Weekly, including Johnny R., Owen O., Dale H., Angel O., and Jack T. Dave Cates is on the show today. Dave is president and CEO of Denison Mines, a Canadian-focused uranium project developer and explorer. The company is listed on the New York Stock Exchange under the symbol DNN and also on the Toronto Stock Exchange under the symbol DML. Mr. Cates, welcome to the show. Hi, Andrew. Thanks very much for having me. Well, Dave, thanks for choosing to come on the show. Uh, why don't you tell the audience about your background and then why you decided to hang your hat with this uranium business? Well, that could be uh, could be an hour long segment right there. But um, yeah, it's in my background personally. I'm, uh, I'm finance oriented. Uh, graduate from the University of Waterloo here in uh, Ontario, Canada, uh, with a master's in accounting. And actually came up through the public accounting ranks, working for uh, Pricewaterhouse Coopers or PwC, uh, and, and happened to have the fortune of working on a number of Canadian mining companies uh, in, in the Toronto area or that are based in the Toronto area. And uh, and that's really what got me into the mining business first. Uh, from there, I ended up uh, being allured or, or drawn over to uh, to the uranium space in, in uh, about 2008. And of course, that was a real uh, turbulent time for a number of the commodities. But um, a bit of a bold move for, for me uh, to, to leave what had, had gone into the gold space after leaving PwC and then uh, went over into uranium. And it's, uh, you know, you look at it now and we're something like 11 years later. Uh, I, I don't know that at the time I, I knew exactly what I was getting into uh, with the uranium business. Uh, what I've discovered over the last decade is that uh, it's, it's a real niche niche business has a lot of really interesting elements uh, that, you know, I cer certainly have drawn people to the commodity and have kept people in the commodity. But uh, what I've really come to appreciate for it is how it uh, really has opportunities for investors in that it isn't a big space. Uh, it's fundamentally backed up by nuclear energy. So there's a lot of good reasons to look at, you know, why demand for uranium is, and, uh, you know, is, is growing and, and why it's an investable space. But it doesn't behave perfectly efficiently. And I think that's what's interesting when I think about why is this a space that I like to be in. And when I talk to investors, what I try to emphasize is that when things are really efficient, uh, it's, it's sometimes very difficult for investors to make good calls and, and make money. Uh, when things are a little inefficient or maybe a lot inefficient, it creates a lot of room for investors to actually exploit these uh, inefficiencies and generate real returns. And so I think that's that's something that I've come to appreciate over the last decade is really special about uranium and keeps me interested in it and you know really happy to be leading a high quality company like Denison as we sort of position for the next uh, cycle of, of the uranium space. Well, what about this business today, Dave? We've kind of got every Tom, Dick, and Harry out there talking about this market turning any day yesterday, and we've got groups out there that have done so much research and analysis, but they still can't put their finger on the timing nor predict the actions of CEOs. How do you see this market, and how do you prepare yourself as we wait out this business? Yeah, well, it has it has been challenging, uh, no doubt, and I think you know when you when you put it into perspective. You really don't have very many people out there saying that this isn't uh, a commodity that's poised for for a real turnaround. And, and I think at a, at a high level, that's important to recognize that fundamentally people are doing all this research. And you're right, they've been doing the research for years. Uh, and for years, they've been saying that the commodity price has to go up and that it's not sustainable and that there's a, there's a real reason to start taking exposure to the commodity. Um, but we aren't really seeing anyone break that and say, look, there's actually a reason why this is uh, going to be a terrible bull or a bear market and, and you should not be investing. It's, you know, it goes to a little bit of that first point about why I find this industry interesting um, is the inefficiency. You know, we really have a very predictable demand story for nuclear energy. Uh, we've had a slow to respond supply story. Uh, but it's all very predictable. You know, mines take time to build, nuclear reactors take time 
to build. Nuclear reactors use a predictable amount of, of uranium, uh, and uranium mines generate a rough, you know, generally predictable amount of uranium. And so that's why everyone's got the research out there saying that the current prices are just not sustainable. Very few mines can make any money at these levels, and we need new mines to be developed, not, you know, in addition to existing mines continuing to operate for us to actually fill that, uh, the demand requirements with supply. So we, we recognize fundamentally it's a very good spot to be, um, but at the same time, we recognize that the story has not materialized exactly as people would have predicted for the last several years. And there are a variety of you know, real nuanced reasons why some of that's happening. Some of it, again, just the inefficiencies or um, you know, the way of the way our market works. And some of that's simply related to who's actually driving the transacting in our space. You know, we have utilities uh, that are a small group. Um, this is not a very big market. Does have, and again, that leads to some of these. Uh, um, the way the market is is not functioning perfectly efficiently, and these utilities have a variety of sensitivities that are not always what you might think. Uh, typical commodity, you're often thinking about the buy low, sell high. You're often thinking about supply demand moves. Well, then the price will move. The utilities often aren't motivated by price. And so when you take the sort of normal mindset of, well, the price of a commodity has dropped, surely that should in, in, incentivize someone into the market. You don't always see that with uranium. Part of it's because the uranium itself is a small part of the overall cost equation for nuclear utility. And that's totally the opposite of something like gas. Uh, if, you're, if you're burning gas for energy, well, the, the cost of gas is like a critical input in the equation. Uh, if gas goes up, well, the cost of energy goes up if you're making that energy by gas. It it's really doesn't work that way in, in the uranium or in the nuclear energy side. And so that ends up informing how these guys operate. Uh, and sometimes the buyers are really just not motivated by a bargain. They're more motivated by, um, you know, what are their peers paying for uh, uranium? And, and so it does lead to a bit of a pack mentality at times. And that's that that sometimes is the single greatest thing that we can point to around why the uranium price has not already increased. The buyers haven't bought it. You know, as simple as that. If the buyers were to buy their, the, the material they needed, they would find that the price is not likely where it is at today. But as long as they don't keep buying it and they push out that procurement, well, then guess what? Price doesn't go up because they have not actually come into the market. So it is a really different commodity that way and that we don't have those other market players to come in and sort of clean up that inefficiency. Right, a, a really solid point that, that the buyers just haven't arrived yet. Um, and that's that's fantastic. Well, I wanna talk about Denison in a moment, but I wanna just question you just a little bit about Uranium Participation Corp. What do you see coming out of this physical uranium holding vehicle? Are you looking for maybe purchase deals from utilities and governments? Will you monetize some holdings to do dividends or retire shares? Uh, will the vehicle look at offtake finance deals? What do you see as kind of an end exit strategy with uranium participation? Yeah, so we, we manage uh, UPC under uh, Neuro Management Services Agreement. And um, you know our mandate on UPC is really driven by the board of directors. So we're, we're uh, independent of, of them that way. But look, the, the objective is, is, is simple, and it isn't actually to have an exit strategy. It's, it's really about providing investors with the uh, sort of cleanest and, and you know, uh, leanest, cleanest exposure to the commodity without having to take on resource or mining risk. And so we're, we're quite happy if uh, UPC exists forever. Uh, there, isn't, there isn't a mandate to monetize the uh, uranium at a, at a higher price than where we acquired it. And the reason is we've got investors who are coming into the stock every day, right? And so their cost base is not the same as, as, as cost base from someone who's bought the stock, you know, 10 years ago. And so it's interesting because we do get that question a lot and it's a rational question to ask, but it is also something that some of the industry insiders and reporters don't always recognize when they look at things like inventories. And they might look at UPC and understand, okay, well, these guys have accumulated physical uranium. Um, well, that's going to come to the market. The reality is, is that it's, uh, for lack of a better description, the materials in the UPC vault. 
And our objective every day is just to make sure that every shareholder has the best leverage that they can to that commodity. So in, in certain times, say if we traded a premium to our net asset value, we're actually going to be out there trying to buy uranium, raise new money in the equity market and buy uranium. And we're going to try to add sort of a notional pound per share uh, for each of our investors. We trade at a discount uh, to our NAV. Well, then, yeah, we're going to have a bias in, in sort of high discount cases to actually sell the uranium and buy back stock. All of that's still just increasing the, the, the pounds equivalent per share, but nothing really beyond that. You know, it's 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 not about uh, you know a buy a buy and then sell at the height of the market. No doubt, those kind of things could be uh, on the radar for certain people in the space. You know, we've got about 18 million pounds U308 equivalent uh, in in UPC right now. Uh, so if you're a large U.S. or or foreign or global utility, uh, you might be looking at at that as a pretty uh, low risk stockpile of uranium. But it's not for sale unless uh, unless we're, we're we're looking at a really significant premium on that. Otherwise, we're really just focused on maxing out those those pounds per share. Right. And and how do you see the uranium participation? How do you see them being funded down the road if if this takes some time to see appreciation in in the uranium price? How do you guys handle expenses over there? And maybe how can you compare UPC? over to, to more of a, some of the other competitors in the industry, namely like a yellow cake? Yeah, so the model's not, not, not that complicated. I mean, we will we'll raise money in the equity markets and, and we have bylaws uh, that uh, you know, are part of our, our corporate documents that require that we spend uh, 85% of the proceeds that we raise from an equity offering in, in cumulative um, with all of our equity offerings on uranium purchases. And so that does leave us that 15% to fund our operating costs or uh, you know, general GNA and storage costs that go into, into keeping a company like this uh, operating. So we, we've done that uh, in terms of building up a bit of capital through equity financings. We, we certainly can sell small amounts uh, of, of our uranium holdings to fund ongoing costs. And, and that's really no different than, than anything else where you'd have basically a carrying cost on, on the uranium holdings where we might grind down the actual uh, inventory by selling to, to fund expenses. And for us, it's all mathematical when we would do what, uh, all based on our accretion model of pounds per share. So if you're, again, trading at a premium, you're going to want to issue stock uh, to fund expenses and or buy uranium because you're able to raise that that capital at a at a cost that to the existing shareholders is lower than selling the uranium. If we're trading at a discount, well then we're we're apt to to sell the uranium to fund expenses. If you're in the middle, um, you know, trading around NAV, yeah, then you then then you almost have fewer pos- levers around there, and and you and you might look at selling some material also. Uh, because there is a cost on on raising money in the equity market, but but it is really all formulaic driven, uh, and so it's it's quite mechanical the, the way we would do that. When you compare us to, I, I guess our closest peer is is Yellow Cake. Uh, we've done very well to keep our operating costs low over the last two years. We tend to be operating under a one percent um, you know, operating cost relative to NAV ratio. So it'd be similar to like a MER ratio that you'd see for. Um, you know, investment funds or, or ETFs. So that's very competitive considering that this is a, a portfolio that actually requires commercial management day to day for storage uh, and having commercial relationships. And what's most important though is, is that while that's the basic structure, uh, UPC has an amazing track record of actually pulling those levers at the right time and adding to those pounds per share. So while we do need to find the cash flow, if you will, to pay the bills, uh, we've actually increased or maintained a pretty flat level of our pounds equivalent U through eight per share over the last decade, when you really ought to have seen us grind that down just by those carrying costs every year. So we've got a very good track record of that. And the idea is that even though we've got those expenses, we're, we're really able to find accretive transactions along the way that keep the investor exposed to a very similar level. Well, Dave, how does how does the price look today uh, on uranium participation? If you've got a twenty four twenty five dollar uranium price today, do you what's your what do you guys see? 
do you see that this price level is maybe worthy of a little bit more accumulation or what are you seeing out there or is the material even not available at this price level it's just a price out there but there's no depth to the market well the market's interesting right now um you know upc is trading uh, around nav so so bouncing up and down from a small premium to small discount depending on which day you're looking at it. But the actual uranium market, like if we went in there to try to buy U308, it's it's actually quite interesting. And a lot of this is is the fallout of, of that Section 232 process that we saw um, over the last year in the United States and this sort of tail that, uh, has been, <laughs> that we've been dealing with on that process with this 90-day uh, working group that was appointed by the Trump administration. So... What I would say is that we still see the market as being somewhat uncertain. Um, we've been talking to a number of utilities uh, just to understand what they're thinking about the space as we've gone through the uh, you know, various conferences over the last several months. And we've been talking to some of the suppliers, whether they be traders or producers, to understand what material is available. Also, of course, asking around about what Cameco is doing with their buying program. Uh, what, what it sounds like is that the other buyers in the space, so, so call them the fuel buyers, ha- have literally been um, busy. You know, they've, they've been preoccupied with dealing with all of these issues in the United States around 232. The U.S. Utility Group is still your largest collective consumer group for, uh, for, for uranium in the world. And so when they end up on the sidelines, uh, it it's, creates a fair amount of uncertainty and, and takes a lot of liquidity out of, out of the actual space. So we definitely have seen that. Uh, it's, it could be that it's a bit of uncertainty around what will happen if they buy the material. But we've also been talking more recently about the fact that the buyers are actually just busy. They're busy with the fact that they're having to respond to a variety of requests from the U.S. government and having to position their side in this whole discussion around um, you know, domestically produced uranium in the United States. And so that, to me, that's actually quite believable that, that the buyers have been busy through um, the beginning of the year dealing with 232. And they've been busy with this working group and also with, with summer holidays. And that's part of why we really haven't seen uh, the price move and we haven't seen much action in, in the space. I, I, I'm not sure that there's very much material available at, at these price points. Um, I, I think that the, the market really, the, the, the folks who have material, producers, let's say, on this side, understand that fundamental improvements have happened to the market over the last two years that tell us price should be rising. And so they're not particularly likely or, or eager to part with pounds at these low levels. And, and they'd much rather see upward momentum in the price before we actually start seeing a significant amount of, of, of transacting in the space. Very well. Well, let's talk Denison. Uh, share with us, uh, for the audience who might be unfamiliar with the company, uh, tell us a little bit about the key people at the company, the key shareholders on the roster, and also how your management team is aligning themselves with shareholders at these lower price levels. Yeah, well, the company has a long history, uh, and, and that's it's an important thing to consider when, when we talk about uh, sort of the significant shareholders and, uh, and and where the management team sits on the company. Um, you know, the company has been around for, for, for decades, and, and its current sort of incarnation, um, you know, was really formed with the merger of a company called International Uranium Corp. and Denison Mines uh, in, in 2006. Now it's an important important transaction because International Uranium Corp was the uh, Lundin family's uh, foray into the uranium space, and and that's brought the uh, Lundin family's position into and that's how we got the Lundin family's position into the current Denison mine. So, no doubt one of our most important shareholders out there is is the Lundin family. So Lucas Lundin sat on our board for several years, and uh, last year. He uh, he gave his seat up to uh, Jack Lundin, one of his sons, sort of a you know, generational uh, handover for the Denison Mines position. And uh, the Lundins have been a, a key part of, of our ability to raise capital and, and just our strategic thinking in the space. Uh, there's this few, few groups out there uh, that have the experience uh, with the mining space, whether it be in uranium or base metals or precious metals. That you'll find with uh, with the Lundin, than you than you'll find with the Lundin family. Now, in that same sort of history, following uh, that merger, 
We, um, the company was operating assets in the United States, uh, and as the uranium prices were rising in 2007, 2008, uh, the company endeavored to refurbish the White Mesa Mill in, in um, Utah. Now, everyone, uh, I think, recalls what happened in 2008 and how it was a bit of a bumpy road uh, and a rough landing for a number of commodities. You know, at that time, uh, the company went and, and, and brought in additional investment from KEPCO, which is the Korean state uh, energy company. Now, that position has since been jockeyed around within KEPCO uh, and, and remains uh, with KEPCO underneath uh, in their nuclear energy company, KHNP. And so our largest shareholder today uh, will actually be KHNP. They've got around 10%. And then you'll dip down and you'll find the Lundin family position uh, just somewhere in that, uh, you know, five to eight percent range. And, you know, that's that's a great uh, place to, to start, right, to have a, a global nuclear company like KHNP uh, as your largest shareholder and then to have, uh, you know, mining mining uh, legacy of the Lundin family invested in as well. The management team, uh, relatively fresh, uh, I'd say we've, well, I've been here about uh, about 10, 11 years. I've held a number of different roles. Been running the company for just under five years. And in that time, we've, we've brought on a number of new faces as part of our own shift and, and change in our business focus away from operating high-cost uh, conventional uranium mines in the United States about a decade ago to a focus now on developing uh, low-cost, top-tier projects in the Athabasca Basin. And so naturally, our team has transformed over that same time. And so we do have a, a, a real energetic team, uh, but a team that's really only been together for a few years. And so you can see that everyone's been uh, accumulating positions uh, in, in the company. Often that's through our, our LTIP, or Long-Term Incentive Plan, uh, which does grant executives stock options, as well as restricted share units. And so we've actually been making quite a point of making sure that our executives are, are appropriately levered to the company's success over the last several years. And so you will have seen that the RSU positions and option positions have definitely been increasing. A lot of that's also had to do with our executives making choices to take equity over cash uh, when it comes to annual bonuses. Everyone understands that uh, raising cash for a company like ours it comes at a cost. And so the team has often been selecting to take equity instruments instead of cash. And I, I think that's a real positive sign. I know for myself, I'm doing it because I believe the prospect of that equity uh, being worth more in the future is, is, is uh, probably better than I'm going to do by, by investing that cash in, in something uh, through my broker. And, and along those lines, so, you know, as you know, uranium equity prices have been suppressed for many, many years. How has management handled the share ownership during this time, and how should investors manage their shareholding in the company, and what steps has management taken to protect capital structure in terms of capital spending and dilution? And I know you just addressed a little bit, but can you provide a little bit more info on that, Dave? Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, this is the beauty of having the Lundin family in there, is that um, you know when you've got a guy like Lucas Lundin who's made an investment, long-term investment in the company, uh, you know, he's he's unlikely to generate a very good return if all we do is go out there and print stock, right? So uh, at the end of the day, share price is a simple equation that's often often uh, forgotten around the value underlying value of the company divided by the number of shares you have out there. Uh, so having the Lundins there and realizing that uh, we really want to deliver value for a shareholder like the Lundins and any other shareholder – certainly reminds us that we can't just go print stock. And so we have focused on finding uh, non-dilutive ways to fund the company over the last several years. Um, all of, you know, I, I'm personally an accumulator of stock. I have not been, uh, I've not been selling stock. I have been looking for opportunities to acquire stock whenever we've done financings. Uh, what, we, what we've done are two things. Number one, we've raised money without dilution by asset sale. And so in 2017, we sold our, our interest in a toll milling stream uh, for our production from the Cigar Lake mine that was going through our 22.5% owned McLean Lake mill up in northern Saskatchewan. And so we, we really like that deal because the cost of the capital is actually much lower than if we were out there issuing stock based on a steeply, you know, steep discount to our NAV. And ultimately the idea is that we're at a, you know, we're, we're not swamping out the shareholder 
by getting a value that's real close to NAV, uh, reasonably discounted, as you'd have to have for a stream like that, but at a much, much lower cost than just uh, issuing stock. The other thing we've done is we've used the flow-through shares um, in Canada. So, so for those who aren't familiar with it, this is a, a mechanism in Canada where we'd fund exploration activities in Canada by passing on, uh, by raising money at a premium to our share price, and then effectively passing on the tax deduction that would come from that exploration to the subscriber in our financing. And so we've done very well to raise money on, in Canadian dollar terms, pretty much at or, or north of a dollar uh, per share when we've done it. Uh, and and we've done that because we've been using the flow through, even though we've traded uh, through much of that time at, at some level below a dollar. So those are the two main levers that we're using to battle fund fund operations, but also uh, do it without just accepting uh, dilution through the trough of a, of a of a long, difficult uranium cycle. Now, Denison has some other positions with other uranium businesses in Canada and also in Africa. Can you share with the audience how the company got involved with these and what is the end strategy here related to the ownership in these other companies? The company has acquired uh, positions in, in two companies uh, so uh, that are notable. So one would be Sky, Sky Harbor Resources, uh, which is an explorer in uh, the Athabasca Basin. And another is uh, Goviex Uranium, which is a developer in Africa. And both of the investments come from the same sort of um, concept on our side, which is taking assets that have become non-core to, to the Denison story and moving them into companies where they can be advanced properly uh, and where also Denison can can see some value from, from those assets. When you have a large project portfolio like we do in the Athabasca Basin uh, and when we had international assets, it was often the case that uh, investors were not valuing some of those assets. And so what we did in the, in the case of our African assets is we contributed those assets to Goviex. We took a large shareholding back and uh, and we're basically holding that position. The idea is that we, we never really wanted to sell our African assets in the bottom of the market, uh, but we wanted to be able to show our investors that there was a, a measurable amount of value in those assets. And so we've just converted that position from an asset holding to an equity holding in Goviex. And ultimately, we still don't want to sell those African assets in the bottom of the market. Now, we certainly believe that that company has the prospect of developing its portfolio of African assets and generating a lot of value, more so than we probably would have if we were holding the African assets as secondary to our Athabasca assets. So it is very much a wait and see um, in terms of what we'll do with those positions, but we really would love to see values go up before we'd really even have to answer that question. And in Canada with Sky Harbor, similar sort of story. We took a project in our, in our Moore Lake project, which had some uh, good results of high-grade uranium but was not going to make uh, the cut when it came to sort of our capital allocation process because of the success we've had with our with our flagship Wheeler River project. And so we put a deal together there with uh, Jordan Trimble and Sky Harbor where they would be able to work that asset. I mean, we literally might have let it sit for a decade um, because it was in good standing, but let Sky Harbor raise money work on that project and test the the items that really were left to be tested on the project and and if they had success then they were going to get paid for that uh, and and we would have an, a an, a way to get back into that project with with a buyback type provision so you know both just good examples of of really us trying to generate value from a, an extensive portfolio of assets and focus ourselves on actually developing our core assets in the Athabasca basin well said. I think that you covered covered some good pieces there on why Denison has those and, and the story behind them. So, Dave, as you know, there are a number of talking heads coming out of the Athabasca Basin Uranium District, many talking up how good their project is and how quickly they think they can build it out. Denison has been quite conservative in how it approaches this market, and I think it's commendable. What are your thoughts here, and why does Denison take this approach? Well, look, number one, there's a lot of great assets that have uh, been discovered in the Athabasca Basin, and it, it, it really is a premier district um, for, for uranium uh, exploration, development, and production. We, we take a conservative approach on purpose because we believe we need to build our mine to truly generate value. 
uh, and and we do that in the context of the market. I'd love to be able to tell everyone that uh, you know we're a takeout target and all of these things. I, look, I think at some point uh, that's probably true. Good businesses are often takeout targets, but I, I don't. I'm not comfortable marketing that um, that takeout is the exit because the uranium space is small, and there are a few buyers. Um, and I think it's fair to recognize that, yeah, sure, Cameco is an industry leader, and at some point they ought to be a buyer. But they're not a buyer today. They, they've shut down their MacArthur River mine. Uh, I, I don't expect that they will be a buyer uh, until the market has materially shifted, until they've uh, dealt with their own assets, they've brought their own assets back online. Uh, and so I think it's important that you actually advance your assets with a realistic lens. And it's not to say that the others aren't doing that, but we have really focused on testing our project based on a market that improves, but doesn't require a, a uh, you know a hockey stick sort of trajectory in, in the uranium price. And I'll point to two two examples on how we've done this. First, if you go back even this, well, it's over three years ago now when we put out a, a preliminary economic assessment for Wheeler River, we actually used the then current long-term contract price when we ran our base case model. When we did that, it was shocking to most because nobody had seen a model that used a uranium price under like $65. So we did that really as a stress test. We wanted to know, should we actually spend the capital and effort and time, raise the money to advance the project to a pre-feasibility level if it didn't have a prospect of making money in even a moderate or then the then current environment? We were, we were happy in that we could generate a 20, north of 20% pre-tax IRR, and so we did start to advance towards a pre-feasibility study. And of course, late last year, we published the results from the pre-feasibility study, which, which were uh, particularly impressive, and, and I'm sure we'll touch on it. But um, we're, what we did in that model is we used the UXC uh, spot price deck, which actually had our first pounds being sold as low as the mid $29 range. And so we certainly give up a lot of NPV and IRR when we do that in a model, uh, when you compare it against someone who's using say a 50 or $60 price deck. But we do it to make sure that this actually can happen, to make sure that it's commercial today and that we are reasonable in deploying more capital to pursue it in this market. And so that's really the lens we're using in all of this is just really our own version of sort of threshold testing, uh, our, our own version of capital allocations and saying, what should we be spending our money on? Is this project good enough to spend money on it today? Or should we spend more time exploring and add value by adding pounds? Uh, the conservative lens uh, is, is critical in our mind for actually deciding to spend money on projects in this market. Well, tell us about the Wheeler project and what the core project parameters are now with the pre-feasibility pre study completed in late 2018. Give us a highlight of the project and kind of give us uh, the overview of the of the PFS. Yeah, so we, Wheeler River is the, uh, it's the largest uh, undeveloped uranium project in the eastern portion of the Athabasca Basin. And I highlight the east only because it's where we see the existing infrastructure. And so the property is located uh, literally halfway between the MacArthur River Mine and the Key Lake Mill in that southeastern portion of the Athabasca Basin. Uh, there are two deposits on the property. There is the uh, super high grade Phoenix deposit. Uh, this deposit actually ranks as the highest grade undeveloped uranium deposit in the world. It's estimated indicated resources of just over 70 million pounds at an average grade of just over 19%. Uh, about three kilometers away, we've got our Griffin deposit. So this is basement hosted around 2% grade, just under 2% grade, and just over 60 million pounds in the indicated category. Now, with the PFS, uh, there was a significant shift from our PEA from three years earlier, and that had to do with the mining method selection for that Phoenix deposit. We had previously been modeling Phoenix as if it would be mined the same way that Cameco is currently mining uh, Cigar Lake and that's using a mining method called jet boring. Uh, jet boring is, is quite a costly uh, mining method, and what we discovered in the PEA was that it was so costly that our 19% grade was not uh, showing through, really, uh, and, and we ended up with a higher operating margin from uh, 
conventional underground mining approach at the 2% grade Griffin deposit than we could achieve using jet boring at the 19% Phoenix. And so in the PFS, we, you're really seeing the result of uh, two, two and a half years of work evaluating different mining methods and uh, our ultimate selection of applying the in-situ recovery or ISR mining method at Phoenix. Now, that is uh, almost easily said um, and understates the significance of that because you know, with ISR mining, you'd be taking the world's lowest cost mining method for uranium, uh, today representing over half of the world's uranium production, and you'd be bringing it for the first time to the district in the Athabasca Basin that hosts the highest grade uranium deposits. So quite a powerful combination. And that's where our PFS was headlined, was just in the potential for Phoenix to actually become the lowest cost uranium operation in the world. Uh, we estimated that operating costs could be as low as $3.33 US, and that if we layered in all of our capital costs, uh, upfront capex, uh, sustaining capex, and then add in our operating costs, we'd end up with an all-in, a true all-in, or fully loaded all-in of just under $9 US per pound. The Griffin deposit on the PFS came out very similar to what you would have seen in the PEA. Uh, decent margins, uh, $12, just under $12 U.S. operating cost, and uh, fully loaded cost, just over $20 U.S. So very competitive, but but not as uh, just really bottom of the cost curve like that we've got with with Phoenix. Griffin's a really good operation. Phoenix is potentially the world's best. And so that's that's what uh, we've been talking about over the last year. It's been very exciting. Uh, to explain why we believe ISR mining can be applied to Phoenix and how we can generate such an attractive cost uh, profile. Uh, but also around, it's exciting when we talk about what it means for our company uh, and the fact that we truly can justify advancing the project today in today's market so that we actually can be producing tomorrow or in the future when, when the uranium prices actually do rise and, and new supply will be needed. Well, what are the challenges with bringing an ISR operation like that to this high-grade project? Can you can you maybe highlight some of the things that you're seeing uh, that's being a challenge, both maybe technically and jurisdictionally, with regards to permitting, or how does that look, Dave? Well, look, uh, there's there's basically three things that you need for ISR mining. Uh, you need you know uh, permeability. At the end of the day, ISR mining, you're moving a mining solution through the host rock. Uh, and and so you do need to move the solution through that rock, so you need permeability. Uh, second, you need the ability to successfully leach your uranium, so you need uh, leachability. So when that mining solution is moving through that rock, you need the chemistry to work such that it will leach. Uh, and then third, you need typically you need a, a form of containment so that you can manage this mining horizon as you've got you know mining solution in a in a groundwater system. So what, what, I guess there's a number of technical challenges that we had identified and we've really got a solution for when we put the PFS out. Uh, and they relate to each of those elements. So, so metallurgy is almost the easiest one. Uh, we, we know that Athabasca Basin uranium ores uh, leach well with low, P, low pH solution. We've seen that from existing operations and we've seen that from our test work. So that's something that we're generally comfortable with. Uh, permeability of the rock. Well, look, that, that actually was identified as our greatest technical risk coming out of the PFS because the Phoenix deposit and these high grade, you know, this high grade um, deposit is, is not the same as a conventional US or, or, or Kazakh ISR operation. We do not have, uh, you know, homogenous uh, sandstone structure with, with sparse, very low grade uranium in it. We have almost the opposite. We have a quite a varied and disrupted structure, hosted still in sandstone, but that has a lot of uranium in it. For us to average 19%, we have areas uh, that will average well over 40%. And so that was an unknown: is how how will we what will the permeability be like throughout the deposit? Uh, we know that it will not be consistent, and so that that was technical challenge uh, number one. And I guess number two would really be around the containment of the mining solution. In the Athabasca Basin, we do not have uh, sort of the textbook uh, setting for, for ISR. Uh, and, and if I were to distill that, the textbook setting would be 
a sandstone formation that's sandwiched between two aquitards or or layers, geological layers that contain uh, sort of the mining solution that you'll inject into that sandstone formation. So in the basin, we have basement rocks that underlie our sandstone, but we do not have that aquitard above our deposit. It really is the basin, uh, is one large big basin that is, is uh, open uh, above your deposit. And so we've introduced the concept of uh, installing an artificial freeze dome uh, that will encompass the top side of the deposit on all sides and tie it into the basement rocks below, creating a, a, a true chamber, a fixed chamber uh, for us to use for mining with ISR. And, and that's, that is, has not been done. Uh, ground freezing technology is being used every day of the year in the Athabasca Basin at MacArthur and Cigar. So that's, that's, that's under control. But the idea of actually completing um, a, a dome structure in the Athabasca sandstone has not been completed. Now that said, we, we don't have tremendous uh, uh, concern around this and it was not identified as our number one technical risk because the drilling method that we're looking at using is currently being used uh, every day of the year in the oil sands. And that's a, it's a directional drilling method that we're looking at actually drilling vertical holes that bend horizontally and then go over top of the deposit and then key back down into the basement rock on the other side. And, and those kind of holes are being drilled every day of the year in the oil sands. So creative idea, but not really pushing the envelope uh, in terms of technologies that we're using in this space. So where we're at now on all of this, maybe just to give you an update, is uh, we do have a test program that was launched uh, earlier in 2019 that is focused on that number one technical risk around permeability. And so we have seen some early results come out uh, from that program at the end of August, uh, where we have actually broken up our deposit into various representative areas, and we've started testing, uh, carrying out hydrogeological tests in the ore body to actually map out the fluids, the movement of fluids and, and where we can see hydraulic connections within the ore body. And that's really helping us to build a comprehensive data set that will then allow us to properly plan out uh, how we would mine this deposit using ISR and understand where we will have areas of high flow and low flow so that we can plan accordingly. So it's, it's, it's happening right now, basically. The de-risking is, is, is ongoing. And do you see the recoveries uh, being, with this ISR method, do you see the recoveries being more or less the same versus underground conventional? Yeah, we've modeled um, an 85% recovery rate from the well field, and that's that's comparable to what you would have out of conventional. There's, there's, a, there's a prospect here that because of our freeze dome, um, we, we may actually be able to achieve much higher than that. And uh, there's a theoretical you know, prospect of actually recovering more than the pounds that we have in our resource estimate. And I say that more, more in, in, in sort of a theoretical way here because our resource estimate has a cutoff grade. You know, we've got a cutoff grade of 0.8%. That's higher grade than pretty much every other ISR mining operation for uranium in the world. And so it is, it is something that's actually going to be very different. Um, you know, we, we have not seen ISR mining with these types of grades. We're typically dealing with those, you know, 500 ppm type grades in, in ISR uranium mines. Here we've got an average of 19%. So there is a prospect that we will actually see better recoveries. Uh, we certainly saw better recoveries than 85% in our, in our column test work that we carried out for the PFS. So I do think that that's a, a conservative, uh, conservative number in, in our model. And on the, uh, the ISR well plan, can you share a bit about the configuration that you plan to use to optimize the recovery? And you already, you already covered the question about maybe potentially being able to recover more. What's your thoughts on the configuration? Can you just kind of give for some of our technical audience a little bit of an overview on that? Well, it's, it's, that's also a very interesting question. I mean, that's, that's part of why we're having to do these detailed hydrogeological modeling exercises, um, because it, it's, it's going to vary. Uh, you're not going to be able to roll out a universal pattern in this deposit. There will be areas where your spacing will, uh, you know, you want your spacing to be tighter to be able to achieve the type of flow that you might want uh, as you have tighter rocks that you're, that you're working with. And there are going to be areas 
uh, where it might even be so tight that you'd use a a soak, we might call it, rather than a sweep, where you might actually inject the mining solution into a well and then recover it from the exact same well. And, and you can you can conceive that here because imagine you've got that well into an area like our Phoenix Zone A high grade core, where we've got about 60 million, just under 60 million of those 70 million pounds at an average grade of 43%. Imagine you get a well into 43% uranium. Uh, you're going to be leaching as soon as you get that solution down there. And you really don't need the same kind of sweep flow that you would have in a low-grade ISR operation to actually collect and get in contact with that uranium. So this is all going to be very different, but that that's that's the thing, is we are going to see variability in the way we actually approach the well field development, and it will all depend on the geology of the act of the area that we are trying to mine. So it will be quite quite varied, and that that at the end of the day is probably going to prove to be the biggest difference between our operation and uh, and the typical operation. The the other element I think that we should touch on is is the grade that we are looking at pulling out of that well field. So that 85% recovery, uh, when you've got such high grades. That means that we're actually pulling solution out of our well field that's, I don't know, just for reference, is in the range of 10 to up to 20, 25 or 27 grams per liter uranium. Well, that's a very high grade. If we compared that to conventional ISR, you'd be looking at something in the milligrams per, per liter range. So those operations typically have an ion exchange circuit where they're looking to either remove impurities or concentrate the uranium before they actually go and precipitate it. Uh, they might achieve, at the outside of that ion exchange process, they might achieve the kind of grades that we're already getting out of our well field. And so it means that our process on surface is super simplified in that we're, we're planning to go straight to uranium precipitation, meaning that we don't have the capital costs of ion exchange or ore solvent extraction, and we don't have the OPEX related to those as well. It really is a very simple process sheet on surface because of that. And Dave, what is the realistic time frame for Wheeler to come on the Phoenix the Phoenix project? Uh, can you walk us through the major milestones, uh, just what you expect right now for potential time frame for those milestones? And like you said before, potentially, this is going ahead irrespective of what the uranium price is doing uh, at these current levels or higher. Is that right? Yeah, look, that's actually the most exciting part of this, right, is that, um, you know, we, we aren't reliant on the price rising. I, I fully believe the price will rise, um, but it means that we can actually build the mine now and justify doing that, advancing it now uh, so that it is producing when this happens. Now, timeline-wise, uh, look, it's 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 a process. Uh, it's it's a regulated environment here in Canada. We have the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission that oversees the process here, uh, and they are a good quality regulator. Um, but but the the longest lead item here and the critical path right now is the environmental assessment. You you really do need to complete that uh, EA process before you can uh, advance anything. And so we have initiated that process. We made a decision late last year to advance the Phoenix ISR operation. And we submitted our project description, which is the first item to kick off that environmental assessment process. Submitted that earlier in 2019, and we received approval of that in, in uh, May of, of 2019. And so we are now fully into that process. Uh, what I'd say on timelines is that uh, we can control what we can control. Um, and that's getting our documents in, in order and submitted to the regulators. And our plan is to have a draft environmental impact statement uh, to the regulators towards the end of next year. Uh, what happens after that is certainly in the regulators' hands and, and the uh, communities that, that are a part of this engagement and, and consultation process. So what we can do in regards to that is make sure that we're present in those communities, educating the regulators in the communities about what we're trying to do, and focusing on um, really just unpacking what we're proposing for the ISR mining operation. And, and we're doing that every day. Uh, in terms of how long this could take, look, in the PFS, we've modeled that we would start construction 2021-2022 horizon, and we'd have our first production in 2024-2025 horizon. At this point, there's nothing that tells us that's not realistic, 
but certainly as we move through the permitting process, we, we, we have a better idea of, of how long the regulatory review is actually going to take when the ball's out of our court. What is the plan on the long-term contracting front? Are you confident of getting contract deals to help finance this project? And what is the plan for contracting and financing the project? Give, give us an overview there. Well, with the cost profile that we're looking at, there isn't really a price point that we need to um, make a go, no go or start signing contracts, right? And in fact, our strategy is really to remain uncommitted as long as we can. Uh, and, and you know, that that's maybe a, a really big difference, actually, when you think about our project as it compares to others in the space. There's many of the juniors out there looking for contracts with the view of needing the contract to raise money to build the project. They, they need a buyer to be willing to pay a certain price so they can go to the bank and, and get project financing. On our side, you know, we're looking at, you know, roughly 90% operating margin on $29 uranium. And so... We don't believe that we need to base load with uh, long-term contracts to be able to get project financing because we generate a, a very good return even at low prices. And so our strategy is really to move forward without committing material at low costs or at, at, at low prices, which is what you'd be doing in today's market. But it doesn't mean that we aren't going to sign contracts. It just means that we're going to be in a position to sign those contracts when we want to rather than being forced to sign them in a bad environment uh, simply to advance the project. And, and ultimately, right, for the investor, this is an important detail because we are levered to our commodity. And of course, not only do we try to give you the best quality asset and the low cost profile and all these sorts of things, but as soon as we start contracting, we start to take some of that leverage away. And if that's the cost, you know, having to enter into contracts to be able to move the asset forward, you really do have to ask yourself, when is the right time to do that? And having the choice is something that's powerful because a number of the players in our space, they don't have that choice. They need to sign a contract, otherwise their project simply won't be built. Well said. And also you have you have a bit of a financier uh, in-house. Uh, so there's there's certainly no issues with uh, this kind of money um, for for the the level of folks that are involved with Denison and the Lundin family. Uh, certainly a blink of an eye for for capital issues here. Um, so I think that's also important to point out. Now, switching gears a little bit, does Denison have any other interests in Athabasca merger acquisitions at this point? And with the major development projects in the area, Dave, are you of the belief that the Wheeler project has the most feasible project of them all? Yeah, I mean, humbly, we, we, we do think that Wheeler uh, has the most reasonable and most realistic uh, development project in, in the space right now. Uh, part of that's driven by CapEx. You know, all this ISR mining approach is, is, a, is a game changer for CapEx as well. Um, we're looking at an upfront CapEx uh, price tag in the range of $325 million. So an important part of, of being realistic is the ability not only to have a good asset that survives in the market, but the ability to actually raise the capital to build it. Uh, so that is an important part of our story. In terms of, of, of M&A, look, we, we really follow the basin very closely. Uh, we're always on top of our, our the developments from our peer companies. Uh, we do have a preference right now uh, to ISR amenable deposits. Uh, that's something that we knew about well before the PFS came out uh, because we knew that we were vectoring that way. And it's something that we turned our minds to uh, in terms of looking at the landscape and the others in the basin. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, it depends how you want to cut it, uh, we did not find that there were uh, a, you know, a backlog of unconformity or sandstone hosted high grade uranium deposits ripe for ISR mining. In fact, we found the opposite, which is that the majority of explorers, I think Denison included, have pivoted to searching for basement hosted deposits based on the difficulties we'd seen at Cigar Lake uh, in terms of developing a sandstone hosted or unconformity hosted deposit uh, and the success that we'd seen in the Western Basin with NextGen and Fission discovering basement-hosted deposits, and even Denison with our Griffin deposit. And so the space, uh, from our standpoint, is actually vacant or vo relatively void of, of targets for uh, ISR mining. 
And uh, that is a good thing in that we aren't going to change the overall market narrative overnight. Uh, this fact that we are looking at $3.33 uh, OPEX uh, is, is great news for us and great news for Phoenix, but it is not the kind of thing that's going to change the overall supply dynamic, dynamics for this uranium cycle. Uh, the, the deposits just don't exist. What we've done on our side is we have pivoted our exploration focus uh, to be more open to identifying and actually to prefer the identification of ISR amenable uh, deposits. I think we're in a unique position to do that because we probably have the highest level of comfort in the industry with our ISR mining approach succeeding. Uh, and so for us, it very much is an early mover advantage type uh, choice to be seeking uh, other ISR amenable deposits through our exploration activities. Good news is that we also have very good experience in finding them in that most of our technical team that was involved in the discovery of Phoenix has actually matured with us and, and the guys that were logging the core are actually now the guys who are, are leading much of our exploration activities. And I know you alluded to this in the past and I think I have my answer, but what is the end strategy for Denison? Is it is it really becoming a producing operating company long term or would you rather look for a sell off at some point? What is on the table? Is everything on the table here, Dave, or is it really moving towards really being a, a producing operating company? Well, and anyone who tells you that everything isn't always on the table is, is, is lying because everything is always on the table. But um, th th there's two parts to that for me. Uh, number one, I'd, I'd love to see Denison uh, be a producer again, a company with such a long, rich history in, in Canada and in uranium mining up in our Elliott Lake, uh, historic Elliott Lake uranium mining district. Uh, so I'd love nothing more than, than to return the company to that to that state of being a respected uh, and, and important global miner of uranium. But number two, and, and maybe to get more into the nuts and bolts of why it makes sense, becoming a producer uh, opens up a lot in terms of uh, a re-rate for us. Um, you know, right now we're, we're trading typically in that sub 0.5 PNAV ratio, uh, often down to a 0.3 PNAV, depending on whose report you're using for NAV of our company. Uh, for, for me, becoming a producer is really just about unlocking that value. I think we have the prospect of, tra of becoming an intermediate producer in a market that has a void, where there's a void of inter intermediate producers. Sub Cameco, uh, you really, there actually isn't an intermediate producer that you can invest in. Uh, last cycle, it was Uranium One. They were ISR mining in the US and Kazakhstan, and they had an amazing run. Now, to go to your question, Uranium One is no longer Uranium One. It was acquired by Ross Adam. I wouldn't say that that's our strategy, but the re-rate and uh, the ability to operate as a profitable uh, and successful mid-sized ISR miner is something that's good on all fronts. Uh, number one, you get that re-rate, but number two, you certainly do become more attractive from an acquisition standpoint uh, when it comes to better uranium times. And so, so really that's our strategy is focus on uh, running our own race, developing our own mines, uh, becoming a leader in that uh, ISR mining in the Athabasca Basin and claiming that intermediate space so that we can be a, a top investment choice. That probably also makes us a very attractive target. And Denison has ventured globally in the past. Is there any desire to look beyond Canada for other assets and projects, or do you feel your your investments in some of the other equities uh, is sufficient at this point? Yeah, we're we're pretty focused in Canada uh, right now, and on and on advancing the concept of ISR mining in the Athabasca Basin. We think, in terms of places to generate value, it's it's that story that will be. Uh, the biggest value driver we could possibly, um, you know, uh, manipulate right now. Uh, but, but like I said, everything is always on the table. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not I'm not racing out to international assets right now. I think the majority of international assets are, are higher cost and can't tell near the story that we're able to tell uh, with being in a stable jurisdiction in Canada with low cost ISR production. Uh, so I, I think it'd be difficult to sort of twist my arm to, to see uh, the international assets as, as being worth either the dilution necessary of acquiring them or, or the diversion of management attention away from the prize uh, at, at Phoenix with the ISR. 
And Dave, why now should investors be considering Denison? What would you say to those that are listening that are thinking about buying the stock? Look, anyone who's looking at buying the stock has got to be a believer in nuclear energy and uranium. Uh, and so let's start with that. Uh, I, I do think this is a unique time to be investing in the uranium space. Uh, we do see the fundamentals uh, in a light that is more positive than we've seen in the last five years. Uh, we have actually seen the market increasing its estimates uh, for demand, which is not something we've relied on in the last couple of years. We've been focusing on supply uh, constraint driving the market. And so you do have demand looking perhaps more positive for the first time in a while, uh, matched up with a market where we've seen s significant supply curtailment. And, and really, I think that's the number one motivator for anyone to be looking at Denison or any of the other stocks is recognizing that when MacArthur River, which is the world's largest and highest grade uranium mine, has been curtailed because it doesn't generate an economic return for Cameco, it should be... Uh, quite obvious that, that the uranium price is not sustainable at these levels. And so I think that's number one. Uh, looking to be exposed in the, to, to Denison is, is really picking to be exposed to the uranium market. And it's actually a very good time to do that. Uh, certainly lower risk than we've seen in the last several years, and with a lot of uh, good reason to believe that the uranium price will rise in the near term, mid term, and long term. Now, once you're there on the uranium business, it is a question of how do you want to get your exposure? And I think Denison is a very interesting story right now from that perspective because of the fact that we've put out this study with Phoenix ISR that has a lot of people talking about it and has, a, has the potential to be truly transformational to our business and to mining in the Athabasca Basin, but hasn't been accepted by all as, as a given. And, and we actually love that challenge because it means that we have the prospect of de-risking this project over the next several years. And that generates meaningful news flow. Uh, when you're going through the permitting process, you know you can talk to all, uh, all of the junior miners out there, no matter the commodity. The permitting process is, is such a bittersweet thing. Uh, yes, your project has gotten to the point where you are deciding to move it forward. Well, that's, that's, that's a sweet thing. But you now have the prospect of years of regulatory reviews and approvals ahead which if your project is taken as a given, well, of course, this is going to be, this is technically going to get built. Uh, really, there's only a negative thing that can come out of the permitting process, which is delay or refusal or uh, cost increase associated with the permitting review. With Denison, you've already got that risk factored into our share price in the way people have risk adjusted their models on ISR mining. And so we're actually going to be able to produce sort of a breadcrumbs of positive news developments as we de-risk some of those technical items on this application of ISR. And that gives us actually meaningful news at a time when otherwise it's actually a pretty stale time of just advancing your project through the blocking and tackling, if you will, of, of permitting. And so I do, I do encourage the investors to look at the vehicle that they're investing in for, for exposure to the uranium space and what are the company-specific drivers within that. Because if the uranium story doesn't materialize as quickly as you might estimate, you're certainly going to want to have ways to generate value. And company-specific uh, news is, is really a great insurance policy to have. I absolutely agree, and I think uh, people should be looking at Denison. It is, a, it is one of those more unique stories out there in the sector and uh, has a lot of good things going for it. Dave, how can folks reach out to the company for more information? Yeah, primary means is definitely through uh, our website and social media, so denisonmines.com. Uh, from there, you can you can pivot to our profiles on, on Twitter or, or LinkedIn or Facebook. Uh, we do try to engage everyone through social media effectively and on a regular basis. Uh, and certainly uh, through the website, there's, there's means to ask uh, questions of, of our investor relations folks or myself. And we do really have an approach of being open to the investor audience. And we recognize that when you're trying to do something like bring ISR to the Athabasca Basin for the first time, uh, that you're going to get questions. And we, we really welcome them and, and really enjoy spending time explaining why, why we believe this is, this is going to be the new and uh, preferred way to mine uranium. Well, Dave, thank you for spending some time with us to talk about uranium and Denison. We hope you come back again. Yeah, thanks very much, Andrew. It's uh, been a real pleasure.